You know what I got the other day, Pete? Stephen King's latest. Want to borrow it? Do you know who you're talking to? What do you mean? Andy, when's the last time I read a paper book? It's been decades. I would much rather use Kindle, or better yet, Audible. What am I thinking? I don't read paper books anymore either. I'm an audiobook guy all the way. For those looking to listen to the books behind the films that we talk about here on Movies We Like, not to mention all the other podcasts in the Next Real family, get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at thenextreel.com slash audible. There are so many great adaptations from Movies We Like available in audio form. Early on, we covered Casino Royale with director Matthew Gratzner. You went through all of the 007 books on Audible, right? I did indeed. What a series. We also covered Room with legendary D. Wallace and Never Let Me Go with costume designer Alana Morshead. We chatted about Fat City with cinematographer Sam Levy and Silver Linings Playbook with the great composer Harry Gregson Williams. 101 Dalmatians and Bambi. Apocalypse Now, There Will Be Blood, The Thin Red Line. There's so many great adaptations with so many great guests, and you can get all these as audiobooks on Audible, along with thousands of other great reads. Producing this podcast is a lot of fun, but it does take a lot of time. We have already dropped the dynamically inserted ads because they are so annoying and have no connection to our content. Plus, they just jam those things in wherever they see fit. We listened when you said you didn't like them. So now, we're directly appealing to you, our dear listener. Please, consider an Audible subscription to help support movies we like and the Next Reels family of podcasts. I've been using Audible along with my family for decades now. I love it, and I've read hundreds of books through it. Couldn't be more pleased with their service, and I know you'll love it, too. Head to thenextreel.com slash audible and get your free trial. It really helps us out. And you have a world of over 200,000 audiobooks open to you. So much great material available. Dive in with a free trial and get your first free audiobook at thenextreel.com slash audible. Start listening to amazing audiobooks of your favorite movie source material with your first free audiobook today. That's thenextreel.com slash audible. Andy, I know you've never been happier than when you're sitting by a warm fire snuggled up in a flannel and basking in the glow of an old-school budget spreadsheet. (sighs) It is a special day I can shut down the world for a little me time. In a world full of applications, why do these antiquated documents and spreadsheets still run the world? And why haven't they been updated in over 50 years? That's why we want to talk about Coda. Coda is a new kind of doc that brings words, data, and teams together. It comes with a set of building blocks that anyone can combine to create a doc as powerful as an app. Coda runs our entire business here at True Story FM, from show scheduling across dozens of podcasts and scripts for thousands of episodes, to budgets and plans and wikis and more. Coda lets us see our business in a new light. If you'd like to shine a light on productivity in your business and save money along the way, check out Coda today at thenextreel.com slash Coda. Welcome to the Next Reel Speakeasy on Rashpixel.fm. I'm Andy Nelson, and that over there is Pete Wright. Hey, everybody. Each month on the Next Reel Speakeasy, we invite a guest from the industry to join us, and instead of serving up their favorite cocktails, they serve up movies that they love so that we can all talk about them. We'd like to welcome our guest to this month's show, director Steve Miner. Hailing from Westport, Connecticut, Steve was introduced to the world of film by his mother, a film librarian at the Westport Public Library. After a stint as a ski bum in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, Steve started his career as a PA on industrial films in Westport. He began working with Sean S. Cunningham and Wes Craven, helping out as a PA and assistant editor on The Brutal, The Last House on the Left. Steve then produced Friday the 13th with Cunningham, who also directed it. That led Steve to his directorial debut with Friday the 13th Part 2, followed by Part 3 less than a year later. To this day, Steve is still the only person to have directed more than one of the franchise's dozen films. Steve directed one of my favorites of his, House, a few years later, followed by a film that showed he could shift gears, the comedy Soul Man with C. Thomas Howell. He directed another horror film that spawned its own franchise, Warlock, before jumping into TV and directing the pilot and first season of The Wonder Years, a TV show that was a key element of my childhood and one which garnered him a DGA award and three Emmy nominations. Since then, he has been working fluidly between TV and theatrical films. Steve has made films like Forever Young, Halloween H2O, the best in the franchise after the original, and Lake Placid, Another Guilty Pleasure, which spawned its own series of sequels. 
His TV work includes the pilot for Dawson's Creek, Chasing Life, and Switch to Birth, along with many episodes of TV shows including Chicago Hope, The Practice, Felicity, Smallville, and Psych. Welcome to the show, Steve. Thank you. Good to be here. Steve, I, I got to tell you, man, we are, we're so excited to have you on the show. And when we realized that we had this weird connection and that you were available and, and willing to come talk to us, we felt so unbelievably, unrepentantly cheeky that we were going to have you, with your background in horror, come talk about a movie like the movie you picked tonight. Okay. And yet I realized you have an incredibly varied background. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what that looks like for you. You certainly didn't get stuck in horror. Uh, you've you've done a lot of stuff. Can you can you kick us off by just telling us a little bit about the trajectory of your career? I was a uh, ski bum in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, and looked around. And this is when I was in my early twenties, and uh, said, uh, "Boy, I don't see a future here for me." There'll be a guy <laughs> 30 years old doing the same stupid stuff I was doing. I thought, man, I don't want to be doing this in 10 years. And I'd always liked movies. My mom was a, a bit of a movie buff and was also happened to be the film librarian for the Connecticut Library Film Circuit, uh, where I grew up in Westport, Connecticut. And I was exposed to a lot of different kinds of movies and shorts uh, growing up because my mom would bring them every couple of weeks, a bunch of films home for a uh, her and us to watch, and she would decide which films to buy for the circuit. And it was at the time of the Canadian Film Board uh, financing all these fantastic uh, short films. I don't know if uh, any of your readers are aware of their the films that the Canadian Film Board made uh, in the 60s, I think it was, that um, were just artistic and creative, uh, huge successes because they didn't have to make money, I think. And it was supported by the government. But anyway, they made a whole bunch of those movies. And it sort of opened my eyes to filmmaking. And uh, also my mom was a, a Hitchcock buff. And she would take me to, to the uh, Hitchcock movies. And uh, I remember riding. She took me out of school. And I, we rode in on a train to New York City to see North by Northwest uh, at Radio City Music Hall. And we sat in the, sat in the front row of the balcony. And uh, by, on the, uh, on the uh, trip in on the train, she said to me, you know, uh, watching the beginning of the movie because uh, there's going to be this little fat guy who's going to walk out on the screen and everybody's going to applaud and laugh. And she said, that's the director, Alfred Hitchcock. And I said, well, what does the director do? And uh, she told me, or at least what she knew that they did. And uh, so it sort of opened my m mind and eyes that, what? Well, hey, there's actually people making these things, these movies. So it's sort of an early start of thinking about it. Uh, and oh, she also took me to Psycho. And uh, after Janet Lee was murdered in the shower, I said, Mom, I just can't, I can't watch this. It's too scary. I don't know. I was like eight or something. And she, <laughs> oh, Jesus. Which is, you know. <laughs> That's really sad and, and prophetic. I do. <laughs> Everything makes so much sense. Now it's making sense, right? So, and she said, well, you know, if you can't, can't stand it, go go stand outside in the street and wait for the movie to be done. I'll be out and get you. <laughs> so, I was eight years old standing out in the street waiting for Psycho to be over. And I had to ask my friends what happened at the end because I was too scared to, to watch it. Uh, anyway, so then uh, when I, I was an art student, I was going to be an artist. And when I uh, decided that I was going to pursue the romantic dream of being a ski bum in, in Colorado, and uh, after a year of that, deciding that uh, it was fun but no future, uh, I thought, well, I'm just going to become a movie director. So that's what I did. <laughs> that after, so funny. after that whole story to, to end up saying, hey, I think I'll become a movie director. It, you, it seems so nonchalant. Well, it was a, it was a kind of a serious decision, actually. And um, and uh, I did the only thing I knew to do is I moved uh, back to Westport, Connecticut, because the only person I knew had anything to do with film other than my mother buying films for the library circuit was a uh, kid I went to high school with who, instead of going to college, went to uh, work for his neighbor who was an uh, industrial and sports and sort of educational filmmaker. And so I called my friend up and said, hey, you know, I'm really interested in getting into film. He was working at the time as an editor for this guy and, and cameraman. And uh, I said, uh, you know, can you help me out or anything? He said, sure, come on back and I'll introduce you to the to the filmmakers in town. Westport's a very kind of artsy town or was then. It's not anymore. And so that's, I got started there in Westport, you know, I want to be a movie director. So 
what do you do? You move to Westport, Connecticut. That's what they say. Little Hollywood, <laughs> Westport, Connecticut. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, so that's, uh, and I just started working there in uh, various capacities, uh, you know, as a gopher. And then I learned editing and I had an editing company and I did production side. I did work both post and, and uh, post production and uh, as well as uh, production, uh, working my way up to sort of a producer, production manager and editor. And uh, one day I heard that uh, someone in town was shooting a movie and I knew the family of the producer. I didn't know him well. He was a little older than I was. But uh, uh, I hunted him down and got him to hire me at uh, 15 bucks a week as a gopher on uh, Last House on the Left, the original one. So I started my association there with uh, Wes Craven and Sean Cunningham, who were doing that movie. And uh, we be stayed working together off and on and friends uh, ever since. So one, so a couple of years after that, and I, Sean and I were both pursuing stuff, Wes as well, but uh, Sean called me up one day and said, hey, um, I had a great idea for a title for a movie. And uh, he told me what it was. I said, yeah, that's a really good, good idea for a title. So we took out, we had no money and somehow scraped together, I think it was $400. Took out a full page ad in uh, Weekly Variety announcing this movie that we had available, which of course we did not. And we got all these telexes back before faxes. So we want your movie for distribution. And uh, Sean and I looked at each other and said, boy, you know, we better come up with a script. <laughs> and uh, so he knew a guy in the next town who wrote for the soap operas who ended up writing a script. And that, that was Friday the 13th. Wow. That was the birth of the franchise right there, huh? That was the birth of the franchise. And, um, and so in a way, it was sort of an accidental uh, way of me getting into doing horror films. It was sort of like... I get, you know, a window of opportunity, but at the same time, I had uh, always watched them and was, if not a fan, at least understood the, the, how they worked. And uh, I mean, from watching, I remember watching uh, uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon with my dad on TV and being really, really angry that you didn't, that last bit, you didn't see the creature. They just, I, I remember the, what was it, a shot of the lake or something? And then they stopped. I said, what happened? What the hell? <laughs> um, so maybe that spurred me on to wanting, wanting to do them, but, uh, it, a little bit, it was a, when a target of opportunity, but at the same time, uh, I think I had an understanding of what made them work. And, uh, you know, I guess I did a little bit. Uh, what I find so interesting about your career is that you were able to shift it, uh, very effectively from horror into kind of doing a lot of stuff and a lot of the dramatic sort of stuff and the, the, the stories about people. And, and, you know, I think that's such an interesting, um, glimpse into some of the, the films that you said, Hey, let's talk about one of these. Cause you did mention a couple of the Hitchcock ones like North by Northwest and right. psycho, but then also the Philadelphia story, which is the one that we're talking about today. I think that says a lot that, you know, it, it's not necessarily just about the genre for you, but it actually, uh, there's a lot more going on to, to, uh, what makes a great film. So looking at that, how did you end up uh, coming to this film? What was it about this film that uh, said, you know, that's the movie I really would love to talk about? Well, it's always been one of my favorite movies. And, um, and I, I, think it's, I think it actually is a lot of filmmakers really like this movie. The reason is, for me anyway, besides that it's entertaining as hell. You've got, you know, three of the greatest actors ever uh, working together uh, on screen at the same time. It's a character study of Katherine Hepburn's character. It's a character flaw story is basically what it is. And um, everybody in the character, and, and, and it's all driven by the characters. The story is beautifully driven by the characters. And it's what, you know, any movie to be successful, uh, there has to be some form of the character in the movie driving the story, not, it can't just be, uh, you know, uh, uh, just construction of plot. And, uh, and Philadelphia Story it was a brilliant play by Philip Berry uh, and, uh, and brilliantly written for the screen by David Ogden Stewart and um, beautifully directed. But it, it started with the script and started with, and I believe that's where all good movies start with is the screenplay. No, you're slipping red. I used to be afraid of that look. The withering glance of the goddess. I didn't think that alcohol would do... Oh, shut up. <laughs> Oh, please, Mother. Maybe he's going to soccer again. It's what everybody feels about you. It's what I first worshipped you for from afar. George, listen. First, now, and always. 
Only from a little nearer now. Hey, darling? I don't want to be worshipped. I, I want to be loved. Someday over the rainbow, way up high. You have a good mind, a pretty face, a disciplined body that does what you tell it. You have everything that it takes to make a lovely woman except the one essential, an understanding heart. And without that, you might just as well be made of bronze. And the night that you got drunk on champagne and climbed out on the roof and stood there naked with your arms out to the moon wailing like a banshee. I told you I never had the slightest recollection of doing any such thing. What in the name of all that's holy am I to do? Tracy. Yes, Mike. Oh, Parson, Parson, he's never seen Kidridge before, has he? Now, look. I got you into this thing, and I'll get you out of it. Will you marry me, Tracy? This is such a great script. There's so many interesting things happening, so many great characters in this. And I love the the uh, kind of the character transformation that you get with uh, Tracy uh, over the course of this story. It's it's really kind of a, a beautiful story about this uh, this woman who's kind of seen as a goddess and who has these uh, flaws because of how she kind of views the world that kind of as she, you know, that line at the end when she's talking with her father and it's just like, oh, I feel... I feel like a human, like a human being. I mean, I just, I, that is just like such a powerful transition that I find for her. And it's, it's a really kind of a, a great look at, uh, at this world. And, and regardless of whether, you know, they bring up the, the class quite a bit in this film, the different classes, but take that out of it because I, you know, I think so much of it is just about a, a human trying to find her path back to kind of being uh, a real person. Yeah. It's a classic, uh, character change storyline um, where the character that you, you know, has uh, all these great qualities, uh, but there's one, one flaw. There's one, one, one thing that's wrong. And I think what's also interesting about it is that uh, the character played by Cary Grant had a, a major flaw, character flaw, but he fixed it before the start of this movie. He was an alcoholic and he was uh, driven uh, his his behavior was uh, bad behavior driven by his uh, alcohol problem. And before the story begins, he's fixed it. And you don't really realize it. You don't know until, I don't know, somewhere in the middle of the beginning of the second act or middle of the second act uh, that he had confronted that problem and fixed it. And I think that in a way, that's uh, how he was able to help uh, the Tracy Lord Catherine Hepburn character confront her her problem uh, that because he was able to fix his I found that really interesting too and and it, it's a the point for me was uh, you know when uh, Stuart shows up with the champagne and says you know I, I brought you a drink and he doesn't take the drink and they have their conversation about you know kid and we can talk a little bit about the story in a bit but what I thought was so fascinating about that was my reaction my emotional reaction to that moment uh, I came to such a clear understanding of Cary Grant's character uh, that it made the opening sequence the with no lines, but when we see him uh, leaving the house and she breaks the the you know golf clubs and uh, you know then he he pushes her down by the face, which is a uh, you know we can talk about that separately. But it's a yeah. it, it's a, a bit of a shocking you know but perhaps today's media climate makes that even more shocking even though on screen it's it's made sort of much more kind of playful. You know I find that really fascinating that 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 scene I love that you know that, that opening of the Philadelphia story the silent scene is just brilliant and brilliantly done. And, but, you know, we're so uh, used to these days seeing an old movie and anything that was meant to shock back then basically doesn't shock anymore. And I don't know that that sequence was meant to shock so much, but it's a bit shocking. He's so physically, uh, you know, you'd be arrested today. <laughs> you couldn't yes. do it. Right. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't do it. And, and so it's interesting that it it's, you know, in those in, in those days, we I don't think we ever would have made a, any sort of assumption that this is a film about a woman coming back, returning into a, to an abusive relationship, right? But today, it's it's hard not to see it that way. You have to sort of put yourself in in uh, sort of of the time to to remember kind of what they were really going for. It was probably an abusive relationship because of his drinking, and probably contributing to it was her uh, her goddess, uh, you know cold and um, unyielding character. And so that 
even though we, I think as an audience, are from the beginning rooting for those two to get back together, no matter how much we love Jimmy Stewart and, uh, and, and like or dislike uh, her fiance, which we never really like. But we're always underneath it rooting for her and Cary Grant to get back together. And what I think is interesting is that you need both of these people to come to terms with their problems for that to happen. So and I think that's a universal story. Uh, we all have, you know, our character flaws that stop us from either being happy or, or, or being in a, in a relationship that uh, works on both <clears throat> both sides. And it works so well with uh, Catherine Hepburn, I, you know, just something about her personality. And I, I read something about this, like at the time, because, I mean, we can talk about later the whole box office poison thing that people saw her as at the time. But, you know, people kind of she she was kind of this character, right? She was kind of this yeah. this, you know, this socialite from money back east. And that yeah. was kind of the impression that people had of her. And it was kind of in a weird way. It was like the audience got to see this this come up and send this this person of that status kind of uh, have to kind of find a find a new place. And yeah. it's kind of interesting looking at it, at it that way, that Catherine Hepburn really fits so well with this. And it makes sense that, you know, she was behind the, uh, you know, when it was on stage, she was on it uh, and she was uh, um, so intrinsic in actually getting the stage show made and, uh, and getting and, the movie made and getting the movie made. Exactly. Yeah, she bought the film rights for it and uh, with her a help from what I understand from Howard Hughes. Yeah, but, absolutely. You no, know, she, right. uh, Catherine Hepburn was, uh, you know, this very uh, privileged uh, upper class uh, uh, woman from uh, New England not Philadelphia, but still, it's just, she, that was her background. I think what you see in that movie is essentially how she grew up. Right, which, uh, you know, it's interesting because Barry, who wrote the play, he wrote it, um, uh, from what I read, it was based loosely on Helen Hope Montgomery Scott, who was a Philadelphia socialite known for her hijinks, who ended up marrying a friend of his. And so he kind of knew this socialite that seemed, you know, very much of this kind. And so he wrote yeah. this play. And uh, it, I think that anybody who knew uh, Helen probably could see that in the film. But um, yeah, I think he also had in mind uh, Catherine Hepburn to play the part as he wrote it as well. And she certainly, like we said, she fits it. She's uh, she's great in it. Fantastic. The the whole idea of screwball comedy um, obviously circles around this because it kind of fits the uh, the screwball comedy genre a little bit. Um, it's interesting because it, it kind of dances around that. It certainly fits just kind of a, a general kind of romantic comedy. Um, there was a, a philosopher, Stanley Cavell, who coined the comedy subgenre of screwball comedy called comedy of remarriage. Uh, yeah. which he said it was uh, popular in the 30s and 40s, where a couple would divorce and then flirt with outsiders only to remarry, which, because of the production code, ended up being a useful way to actually have other people uh, philandering, basically, which yeah. <laughs> was yeah. an interesting uh, interesting yeah. way to put films together at the time. Yeah, and I think there, there are quite a few that have that sort of uh, plot plot to them, although uh, Philadelphia Story is, the, I think, the only, the only one that I'm aware of that has really held up uh, like the, over the years. But, you know, I, I think that it's really not quite a screwball comedy. And even though people talk fast and they're very funny and they're very clever, uh, you know, when I think of screwball comedies, you know, I always think of bringing up baby as like the ultimate screwball comedy. And for and that, you know, it has like crazier characters, more outlandish uh, plot uh, devices like the leopard and and those odd sort of things that happen in that in that movie. So. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's like right on that border of screwball comedy, but I think it's a, I don't know, to me, it's a bit more real than that. I, well, I think so too. And I, I, and you, boy, do you ever get it right in the, the sort of middle 50 minutes of the film. It's sort of uh, where, where everybody is just drunk. I mean, they won't show philandering, they won't show infidelity, but man, do they show a lot of booze. And it ends yeah. up being sort of a central kind of pivotal uh, bit of her transformation. Uh, and, uh, you know, in dealing with these other relationships that she has to deal with, everybody has to deal with their relationship with, you know, alcohol and what they do with it at night, uh, in order to come to terms with who they are in the morning. And I it gets it gets surprisingly heavy. Yeah, I thought it was really, I, I agree. I mean, it's one of the things in when I was watching the movie again uh, to prepare for this that I noted was it how much of, of, of alcohol plays in the story, in the background, in uh, people's uh, revelations and, uh, and, you know, obviously Cary Grant's main problem. Yeah, it's really, I don't know, it's, it's funny how, how 
how much alcohol is in this movie. It, yeah, it really wasn't there to add sort of comedic texture, which which is often what we see, you know, when the, when the characters have to they they drink and they do stupid stuff. For this, it they it was really part of the underlying fabric of the film, especially because of the of what we learn about Cary Grant and his relationship with alcohol. Like everybody has to is ultimately on Cary Grant's path. He was just there two years earlier. And but and as a side note, I think I I really think Jimmy Stewart did an amazing job of acting drunk. I mean, I, yeah. I had that note, too. I told my wife, I'm like, he is such a good drunk. He just it's like flawless, <laughs> even though it's it's fake. I mean, I don't think I've I've certainly been drunk in the past and I don't think I could have acted like that. But I mean, it's just so perfect because you just it just you buy 100 percent of uh, that of his whole performance. But that that particular part of his performance, I thought was fantastic. Although I have to say, in Catherine Hepburn's defense, she holds her own as a drunk. Yeah, yeah you're right. She was really good, <laughs> especially. In, in that scene when when uh, he's carrying when uh, Jimmy Stewart's carrying her back uh, from uh, the swim, yeah. and there's her, there's Cary Grant and there's her uh, fiance, and the way she says a load of all three of them, it's just <laughs> like it's precious. It's it's just fantastic. What does she say? It's My feet so, are made so of much. clay. Did you know? Did you know? <laughs> I, that. I love it. Easy, easy, old man. She's not hurt. No, no. Not wounded, so but dead. Seems the minute she hit the water, the wine hit her. Now look here, Connor. A likely story, Connor. Hello, Dexter. Hello, George. Hello, Mike. <laughs> I used to see, I had an office in New York for a while uh, on the Upper East Side, and I would walk by her, uh, her uh, uh, brownstone every day from Grand Central Terminal to go to, uh, to my office. And um, one day I remember looking over <clears throat> after I'd passed her place and seeing her in her car driving. And she had and she looked just like she got out of the uh, out off the set. I mean, she had a big hat. And but she used to drive this like 20 year old Chevrolet. Um, and she, she was just an amazing person. I think. Well, she's delightful and she's very different. I mean, she is a unique performer, um, the, not just, you know, her ability as an actress, but her look and her demeanor on screen. It, it is unique for the period and that her period ended up lasting as long as it did. Right. I mean, I could we'll go all the way to Golden Pond if you want. You Absolutely. know what I mean? Like, but, uh, you know, it's uh, one of the things I, I tell young actors and uh, to watch these movies. One reason to watch a movie like this is um, one of the reasons Catherine Hepburn and Jimmy Stewart and Cary Grant were so unique were their voices. Uh, they had very distinct voices and they had incredible um, uh, control over their voice box and their diaphragm. And it was a huge tool in their arsenal of acting. And it's one of the things that I think... Um, a lot of young actors are not really aware of and to develop a voice and to uh, or develop your voice. And uh, the more singular and unique it is, you know, think of Gene Ar Arthur, mm -hmm. uh, uh, any of these great stars, especially back then, uh, had fantastic, unique voices. It's not that far. I mean, all of these people were around when the silent arrow was still there. So clearly they were aware of how critical your voice was and how the sound of that um, was was a key part of your presence on screen because they had been seeing people's careers fall apart because they transitioned from or they couldn't transition from sound or the silent films to the yeah, sound films. That's true. I hadn't thought about it. That's a good point. Yeah, so it's pretty interesting. You know, it's so interesting uh, while we're talking about Catherine Hepburn, um, you know, she this was uh, the, her first big hit after a bunch of flops that she had done, including Bringing Up Baby, which I always find so strange that that movie was a flop at the time. In 1938, this was, uh, you know, a Manhattan movie theater owner, Harry Brandt, uh, along with some other movie theater owners, put together a letter about, uh, you know, actors that they thought were box office poison that uh, weren't going to bring the money to the box office for them. And just looking at the list of names of people that they had listed here, I mean, Greta Garbo, Marlena Dietrich, Mae West, Joan Crawford, Kay Francis, Norma Shearer, Louise Rainier, John Barrymore, Dolores Del Rio, Catherine Hepburn, of course, Edward Arnold, Fred Astaire. Uh, you know, it's it's such a strange <laughs> list of people that these guys were like, no, you can't put them in a movie because nobody will come. It's a, Look at, kind of a terrible thing to do, really. I mean, 
the Brandt uh, family owned theaters. My path crossed with uh, members of that family at some point many years ago when I first started in film. But um, uh, they were a par- powerful family and they owned a lot of theaters. Uh, but just sort of a callous and cruel thing to do to publish a letter like that, uh, it just seems inconceivable today. Well, and pretty much if you were a woman working in film that year or you're Fred Astaire, yeah. then you're poisoned in the box office. Well, that, that's fairly telling, too. It is. It's, it's a, virtually all women. And it's, it's terrible. Yeah. Terrible. yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, and, and I think they were really affected. I know that the, the story goes that Catherine Hepburn was really affected by that. And she saw this vehicle, Philadelphia story, as her way to be, you know, back to successful movie making and uh, bought the rights or acquired the rights with, uh, I think, Howard Hughes at the time yep. and uh, and knew that this would be a good vehicle for her to use. She was obviously very smart about it. Well, it took a big risk. I mean, the, the fact that she took on the stage play for uh, a zero salary, but a piece of the back end, which ended up being yeah. incredibly fruitful for her. Uh, but it, in order to be able to drive this property to the screen, I mean, that is a that's that's one of those sort of like I'm a chess player. I can see, you know, 15 moves ahead yeah. sort of a move in the industry to be able to to do that with her career, take the time and, and devote it just to get this thing on screen. Um, it, it's savvy. And, and especially at a time when she was supposedly box office poison, right. that just put that through. And to do it, you know, I, and she getting it made at MGM, which at the time was the premier movie studio. And you can tell it by looking at the sumptuous sets and the production value of that movie yeah. uh, was a, another coup for her. You know, uh, I read and I that uh, originally she wanted um, uh, other actors and uh, but Louis B. Mayer wanted to try to ensure any box office success by getting Cary Grant and Jimmy Stewart, which uh, was uh, really helpful. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, that's the, the other thing is like she was able to actually kind of get herself in the contract where, you know, she got to kind of have a little bit of the pick as far as the director. I know she's the one who wanted George Cukor. Yeah. And she also wanted the the um, Ogden Stewart to come on board to write the screenplay. Yeah. So, you know, you know, she brought this property and had a lot of say in how it got made. And I think that's, uh, you know, really savvy of her. And, I mean, George U- Cukor, they had worked together, um, I think, four times before this yeah. film. And yeah. uh, along with uh, working with Cary Grant on a couple of those. And I mean, he was known as the kind of a woman's director or an actor's director. And, you know, I think she could tell that this was definitely the sort of story with characters that were so rich as these that Cukor was uh, like really a perfect director for this type, type yeah, of story. He, he was a great director and he uh, he did a you know, was per- virtually perfect job with this movie, not only um, with uh, being really smart about opening up the stage play the way he uh, with the scenes he set outside and. And, you know, some opening it up to uh, not just be stage bound, but even more at the same time when he's into a scene with, uh, you know, a bunch of clever writing and clever repartee and great dialogue. He's content to just let it play, you know, in a three shot or a two shot and um, not mess with it. Let the uh, let the uh, quality of the script just play. Now, as a director, when you watch a film like this and you see what Cukor is doing here, I mean, what are you drawing from that? Are you seeing stuff like that that you can go, gosh, I sh- that's that's a brilliant tool that I can use, whether it's Lake Placid or whether it's, uh, you know, uh, something like Soul Man or something that's definitely uh, more character based? Yes. Yes and no. I mean, you know, we are, it, it, who knows who we steal from? We all <laughs> right, right. Everybody, right. And um, I remember doing a when I was. Speaking of Lake Placid, I we went Lake Placid, and I, I had this idea after uh, uh, op- opening a crocodile attack on the on the guy to uh, cut to a shot of a of the leg falling to the bottom of the lake. Well, after shooting it, I realized I stole that from Jaws, and I didn't include it in the movie. <laughs> I, and it was something that you know, I, Jaws is a movie I I knew pretty well and loved, and uh, by mistake stole that shot. <laughs> so, so funny. It, you know, it's almost uh, how do we get our how, get our ideas, and we're always building on other things. But I, I think really watching this movie, and I'm after many times watching it now. Watch, you know, what does he choose to have when the actors move, move from a one room to another, or walk down the outside, or set it on a horse, or 
you know, um, w what he chose to do uh, that was not stage bound and what he chose to just keep as people standing in a semicircle and talking. Uh, it's it's a master class on how to uh, how to sort of, uh, you know, block one of these kinds of movies. We let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the first shot, last shot, a regular thing we uh, do here on the show. We talk about the, the very first shot the director chooses to open with and the very last shot that we close with and see how well they they connect together. Uh, the first shot is we've, we've got this we open on this high society uh, house in Philly uh, and we dissolve in to see uh, Dex uh, storming out of the house with all of his belongings. And Tracy, his wife, is chucking all of his goods out onto the street uh, or into the drive and and eventually uh, she breaks the golf club over her knee. And it's all, it, it, there, there, there's no yelling, no screaming, no words. Uh, it is all silent. He then follows her back to the door. He, it looks like he's going to raise his hand to, to hit her, but he ends up putting his full palm on her face and pushes her into the doorway. And we, we cut to her on the ground, uh, then getting back up, clearly angry. And, but unhurt. Unhurt, yes, absolutely, unhurt. So that's the first shot. I think the first shot is a closed door, or is it the house? No, no, it's, it's the house. It's the that's house. Kind of the first shot is a white yeah. side of the house, and so we right. we dissolve into the opening sequence. So, uh, and then yeah. the last shot. The last shot we have, uh, you know, Tracy, Dex, and Mike frozen at the altar in the photo. Uh, that kid snuck uh, as right. he kind of sneaks up to the altar to take the picture, and we see the photo of them in the magazine. And then the page turns. We see a few more photos, and then of course turns to the end. The f the first shot, it, the house sets where the tone is of, you know, you're going to, you're going to be into, uh, watching some rich people, I think. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Two right. hours with right. the rich. Get ready. <laughs> and, um, and then the, the last shot, you know, being, I think of it as that frozen, uh, still shot. Although, you know, you, like you said, they, they cut to a couple more before the end. I think that what that last thing with the three of them frozen, you know, you just like Jimmy Stewart and Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn so much. You're rooting for all of them. And it sort of gives you this feeling of a continuing story. You know, there's going to be more to this story. And it kind of makes it makes you uh, makes me feel good that it's this world is going to continue once this movie's over. Uh, and you, you leave the movie with a good feeling, whether it connects with the first shot or first sequence. I don't know. Does it? You know, it's interesting. It's a tricky thing to to see the connection really between the first and the last shot in this particular film, other than it's about society and high society and how other people see them. And we certainly start with kind of, uh, you know, we're inside the world of the high society. And by the time we get to the end, now we're outside of it with the tabloid with spy magazine, right? As, yeah. <laughs> as we're, we're stealing photos with the, with the uh, publisher, um, of this wedding. And I like how Mike has now kind of almost crossed the line and now he's become a subject in the photo rather than the, the writer writing the story on them, which I think is a, a pretty clever twist on that ending there. It is. And I think, but now, and now that you mentioned that I'm thinking about it, that what, what's interesting about the class, um, divide in this in this movie you know the upper class and the lower classes and they're kind of you know my mike and uh, and uh, dexter are the symbols of the two of them clashing but but through the movie uh, i think it's a part of sort of the american um ideology or the american uh ideal uh that there really isn't that much different and in fact Catherine hepburn talks about it when she's talking to jimmy stewart about what a snob he is and, he, you know, and she's saying how, well, you know, there's basically I'm paraphrasing, of course, uh, good people uh, in the upper society and there's bad people in the lower society. And it's just what you are as a human, which makes makes a difference. And that's what, you know, the American dream is all about. So in a way, it's sort of uh, how you mentioned, maybe it's that if there's a connection, it's that they start in high society and you're outside this house looking in. And then Mike, as your the Jimmy Stewart character, as our uh, sort of our like a surrogate man, he's our everyman surrogate. He's now included with them, so there is not that much difference between the rich and the poor. It's just that the rich have more money. Look, see, there is upward mobility. See, 
This is what it's all about. You know, I, for me, there's one other element that I, I feel like is important to at least acknowledge in here, and it doesn't necessarily connect to the first shot, uh, but but just this underlying theme of how the media and how the, the tabloids treat, um, you know, different classes of people. And in the end, you know, we do have this uh, that where Mike has made that conscious choice to escape that place and to to sort of access his inner artist again and start writing and that, that refrain of, hey, you have my book? You know, this is he's always surprised yeah. that other people are reading his work uh, and yet he's relegated to this sort of tabloid journalist uh, so he makes it out of this world and yet kid shows up with a camera so there is this sort of inescapable um, feeling to it that the media this is the end of the apocalypse and the, the cockroach still lives you know you you can't ever really escape it and I for me I find that you know as much as the ending the the final last shot is a uh, is redemptive for these three characters as much as I've enjoyed my time with them uh, it, it's also, you know, it's a little bit sad uh, in terms of its commentary uh, on where we are. And, and relevant today. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And, and, you know, something that Pete and I were talking about before we started a recording is that, you know, this is this is after these guys essentially reversed the blackmail on Kid himself. Uh, by, you know, writing up this whole piece so that he would drop his blackmail that he had against uh, Tracy's family. And uh, and they said, we've got all this on you. And yet here he is still showing up at the wedding to take the photos, which yeah. is like the press just won't let up. <laughs> uh, we've talked a bunch about Catherine Hepburn. Uh, let's talk about the other two. Uh, Cary Grant as C. Dexter, uh, C.K. Dexter Haven, uh, you know, insofar as he's a fantastic uh, choice for this performance. I He wanted apparently... Uh, he wanted two things. He wanted top billing, even though he was not the protagonist uh, in the film. Uh, and he wanted $137,000 uh, $137, to be paid directly to the British war effort for his salary. That's, I, that's what I understand. It's uh, really interesting. And, uh, and the fact that Jimmy Stewart only made $15,000, I think, or something like that. Wow, that's, it just says a lot as far as their place. And this is the year after Jimmy Stewart, you know, was uh, in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, which is yeah, such a great film. Yeah. So it's surprising that he he uh, made uh, such a, a drastically uh, a different salary on this film. Yeah, I don't. I wonder. I don't know. I mean, I a, a guy I worked with uh, found his wife found a contract written between somewhere in a in a bookstore written between Alfred Hitchcock and Jimmy Stewart, signed by both of them. Uh, and I think it was for high anxiety or not high anxiety. I mean, what the, the, vertigo, vertigo. Uh, it the was non funny one. <laughs> <laughs> right. And um, it was it was some really low number, too. It was like and it was a very simple contract. It was just a, you know, a paragraph that Jimmy Stewart agrees to do this Alfred Hitchcock movie for. I think it was like ten thousand dollars. Wow. wow, that's interesting. Or if and there were back, back end deals or something that weren't written down on that piece of paper. I doubt it, but uh, anyway, I, huh. so maybe uh, maybe he never made much money. I don't know. Yeah, very interesting. Word is that Hepburn's original choice was Clark Gable, but right. uh, we've talked about uh, Gone with the Wind on this show, and so listeners will remember the animosity between Gable and Cukor as George Cukor was fired, uh, and and therefore uh, Gable had. Uh, apparently not much of a shot uh, wanting to, to, you know, or he didn't really want to take this film is what I understand. I don't think he would have done yeah. it. Um, I, I, I don't know the reason. George Cougar was a great director, but someone said it was some for homophobic reasons I've read somewhere. Oh, but, interesting, uh, yeah. There was a segment in Hollywood that was very homophobic at the time. Yeah. And sure. uh, But he was, George Cougar was fired off of, uh, or he quit off of uh, Wizard of Oz, too. Yeah. Yep, right. Yeah, had just a little bit of uncredited stuff, but uh, yeah. Well, it's hard to imagine, although, no, it's easy to imagine Clark Gable in that role. I don't think he would have been as good as Cary Grant. And she also wanted Spencer Tracy to play the uh, the reporter, the, yeah. the, the Stewart role. And of course, I think this was before they started a relationship, but I, I could be wrong. I'm guessing that she was still uh, in the Howard Hughes days based on you know, think, the fact yeah, that he funded this one. That's what I understand too. Right, but yeah. she wanted wanted him as uh, for the that role, and I, you know, as much as I love him as an actor, it just you can't imagine anybody else but these two guys in these roles. You need a little bit of of Jimmy Stewart's um, sort of indignant buffoonery. You know, there is that there there is this piece of him that 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 keeps him from fitting in completely, and and you need that in this this threesome between Grant and you know. He looks at people through his eyebrows. 
and he's got this sort of the way he holds his head and he's looking up, you know, kind of through his eyebrows at people. And it gives him this this quality of, you know, I'm not sure about you and uh, I'm not going to be like anybody but myself. And I'm going to be this guy no matter what you want me to be uh, sort of quality to the guy. And it's a. Yeah. Uh, very endearing. He's also, uh, just speaking of endearing, he's also so b- brilliant at being judged silently. The se- there's a sequence in the hallway where he's playing with the spoons, you know, and he keeps he's like <laughs> looking at it and he's being judged by this, the, the, the sort of butler who's standing there watching him play with these, the, the wedding gifts or things, I, I guess, like this. And he, he accidentally puts a lighter in his pocket and he has to turn around. I mean, that, that sort of awkward, endearing uh, sort of tone of Stewart is, is what makes him such a gem in this film for me. Yeah, I and mean, he just plays everything to the max. I mean, he just he's always in the moment, and uh, I don't know. I, and and his voice, his unique quality to his voice. It's such a different uh, sort of character than what he you know had been doing. I mean, the year before with Mr. Smith goes to Washington or Dusty Rides Again, The Shop Around the Corner was released the same year as this. I mean, they all feel so different. And you know, here he is doing this, and there's there's a little bit more of that cynicism with him, and and uh, you can tell. I think it's the sense that you know here he was this this writer and now he's diminished to writing for the tabloids and right. uh, and that comes across so well the way that he plays himself all the time and it's uh, I mean he's just he's brilliant both he and Cary Grant are are just natural fits for this they do a great job um, and they you know the three of them are they had all worked together on various other projects throughout their careers but I mean here I think it's just a highlight of seeing all three of them really at the top of their game. Yeah, absolutely at the top of their game. I uh, so those are the big three. There are a number of wonderful performances in here. I'm gonna kick off my favorite uh, sort of not main three performances, and that's Virginia Wheedler as Diana Lord, Dinah Lord uh, who is Tracy's young sister, a teenage sister, and uh, I think she is charmingly precocious and a little bit creepy. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. I remember the first time I saw this movie, I was a little taken aback by her. Uh, and I think I saw it when I was pretty young and um, uh, th- thinking, wow, that she's a little creepy. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but the more I see the movie, the more I really enjoy her performance and uh, how important it is to to the film. And uh, she was fantastic. Oh, Especially yeah. Especially when you get to the end. and It's just it was me. I was all me. I did this. <laughs> Yeah. I, yeah, I couldn't help but want to go put, put on the bad seed like right after this, you know, <laughs> there's a certain vibe to it. Uh, when she when she sits down at the piano and starts jamming out Lydia, the tattooed lady. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, I was that was in stitches. That was great. You know, it's interesting. She was also in The Women, another Kukor movie. Yeah. And and that one, boy, that fell like a brick to the bottom of our ranking. Andy and I did not enjoy watching that movie, which makes this one uh, a bit of a surprise. Uh, Virginia Wheedler, Wheedler was actually our favorite uh, in The Women. She was also there as a as young uh, May, I think her name. Mary. Mary, yeah, she, young Mary. I've never been able to get through that movie, and I haven't watched it in a long time, so I don't even remember her, her in it. Or if I would have been aware of her. That's okay. Well, you her, didn't even know you're yeah. doing yourself a favor. Don't worry about it. <laughs> her part, I mean, she's you know she's the daughter of uh, of uh, the main woman who's uh, dealing with the divorce, and there's you know the, there's a really nice scene in that film of her and her mother talking about divorce and how you know the hard uh, the hardships that go along with that. Oh. Um, that was really kind of the one scene that I think <laughs> that I I enjoyed. That well, movie. yeah, it's I, on a stretch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, she, you know, and I guess she did not really go on much uh, past her teenage years as an actress. She didn't last very long anyway, because, uh, yeah, she she had had rheumatic fever when she was a child, which uh, nobody ever told anybody. Um, and I think they found out after she had died. She only lived to 41 years old. She died oh. of a heart ailment that uh, that she had because of the rheumatic fever that oh. she had as a child. Huh. You know, everybody, though, all the supporting characters I thought were fantastic in this movie. I mean. Uh, I'm sure you've got uh, your favorites as well. Oh, they're all great. I mean, you know, you've got uh, Uncle Willie, Roland Young playing Uncle you Willie. Know, he's so funny, Roland Young. But that that you know that's borderline creepy the way he. Uh, <laughs> uh, but funny as hell, you know. It's just it's very funny. 
And uh, he's a he's a brilliant comic actor. You know, it's a, it's an interesting bit that they have this relationship that that Willie and the and the father end up having this sort of injected mistaken identity uh, uh, line, which is it's so strange because that's usually the main subject of a film like this, right? Oh yeah. my goodness, this is this is where the vaudeville takes over, and and it turns yeah. out that was just kind of injected as a a little beat between Act One and Act Two. It it's resolved, and it ends up not being a big part of the the film after all. Which which I really liked. It was just a sort of a, a distraction. Yeah, and you know, it's uh, the the that why I say that this is less of a screwball comedy for me is that all the characters in this movie are really smart. They, which makes for a great movie. Uh, you know that, and like you said, this thing about the mistaken identity in a screwball comedy that would have been played out to its hilt, and you know, who knows what kind of hijinks would have ensued if it was if that were pursued in the story, in the script. And the same thing with the whole concept of we're embedding these reporters into this wedding. Catherine Hepburn, Tracy Lord knows immediately that something's wrong here and this can't be really happening for real and that they can't be really, you know, something's going on. Everybody's smart in this, in this movie. And, and they have really interesting conversations. I was really struck this time um, the conversations that, uh, that Tracy has with her father, uh, John Halliday playing Seth Lord, um, and just like uh, how difficult it was really to kind of watch the conversation he had with her about, uh, you know, the world of, uh, you know, implications that uh, that people have uh, toward other people and how um, she is so harsh and that just kind of really kind of putting her down as a daughter. Um, but in a way where it's like it was more just looking at some of the ways that she acted and, and uh, reacted at particular situations and the whole idea of this implications versus facts sort of thing and and the i the way that she kind of walked into the story treating her father and uh, and kind of took all of that uh, and and ended up having to reshape it and the way that she thought about her father and everything toward the end of the film i i just found their relationship so strong in this particular film and yeah that's not something you would see in a screwball comedy right i mean it's right. that no, was like you... really intense stuff yeah and and what and also what uh in the story uh in the is the parallel story with Catherine with uh, uh Catherine Hepburn and uh Cary Grant with her mother and father and how they were separated at the time and that you know there's sort of this parallel story between mother and that going on with mother and daughter and uh I don't know it just gave some resonance and some depth to uh, to the movie the whole idea of the implications that 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 people have and the, the insinuations of things and even just the relationship between uh, uh, Kittredge and Tracy, um, how, how it ends up falling apart because of the way that he, you know, sees that, you know, oh, well, how could how could you not have had an affair with this guy based on all the evidence put before me, you know, yeah. he's just kind of jumping to conclusions and the whole idea of this human frailty and accepting people and, and all of that. And it's, it's really transitioned to this beautiful ending of, uh, you know, looking at people for who they are and really kind of accepting this stuff without jumping to these conclusions and, and the whole human frailty thing. It's, I mean, it's really, I think there's so much power to this story that, uh, it's, I mean, tagging with screwball comedy. Yeah. I just don't, I don't see that, see it there. Did he have an affair with the dancer in New York? I couldn't quite tell the father. My impression from the way that that conversation resolves is it was something that he might have been thinking about, but it wasn't something that ever happened because he kind of says, you know, uh, you know, it wasn't true or whatever. But he kind of goes after her for having accused him and, and kind of jumping on him for all of that. And it was the, it's the exact same situation that she is then later put into. Right. When at the end. And so that's why I think it's it, there's such an interesting thing there. And that's why I think that I don't know the way that I'm reading it now is that her father wasn't really um, it, having a dalliance with this dancer. No, I think that I think they needed to have that that bit of a media mistake in order to keep the the commentary on the way the media treats them alive. Yeah, uh, but that that gets into a conversation that I thought is probably one of the strongest conversations the the, the, the or, or at least perspectives of the dad uh, that I I remember when he's talking about you know the the fight that he has with time and the fact that he had a little girl and in many respects that's what keeps him grounded and and uh, it was an incredibly powerful moment coming from a sort of a, a, a C player in the movie yeah well and I, it works because it was uh, so connected with uh, everything else that was going on in, yeah. uh, with 
characters in the story. And do we want to talk about any other particular characters before we uh, move into uh, a little bit more of the production background? Andy, you wanted to talk about King Baggett, too. I'm, I don't want to forget yeah, that. Wait, I want to ask about King Baggett, but <laughs> I, have to, I have to say that uh, Ruth Hussey was fantastic. And, uh, you know, the uh, Liz, uh, she she was really great. And she was uh, I, I think she was uh, nominated for an Oscar, didn't win uh, for Best Supporting Actress. And uh, but uh, her performance was great. Um, and you know, even what's his name who played, um, John Howard. I mean, you know, he was the perfect, uh, George Kittredge. He was the perfect fiance who wasn't really good enough for Catherine Hepburn. Yeah. And, and represented sort of, uh, that sort of cultural stoic uh, or stoicism, uh, that everybody else is, is kind of shaking three, shaking free in their, uh, you know, their sense of the riches and, and their lifestyle. He was, he was an interesting bit of, of cultural foundation, uh, that they ended up rallying against. He, he was he was reaching for this uh, this sort of world that uh, Catherine Hepburn inhabited, but for all the wrong reasons. He represented that person. You know, it goes back to this class thing where there's good people in the law, you know, and uh, that are poor, and there's good people that are rich. And uh, you know, Jimmy Stewart and he were the perfect uh, opposites for that. And you see the, uh, the, the two perfect examples for me that uh, spell that out exactly why Kittredge is not right for Tracy. First, when he shows up to go riding on the horses and his outfit is like so pristine, you could tell that he's this is so completely not his lifestyle. He has no idea what he's doing. And it, he, he's like so nice that she actually pushes him down and rubs dirt all over him. So that he actually <laughs> looks like somebody who would, should have been out there riding. Yeah. And then the second time is when he finds out that Sidney Kidd is there for the wedding. And, and his reaction is like, oh, how, how thoughtful of him to show up for the wedding. But not <laughs> like only that, yeah. he's willing to forgive her sleeping with someone else to get coverage in Spy Magazine. I mean, not quite yeah. that, but uh, almost. He's willing to forget everything uh, just to get some publicity. Uh, just right. the opposite of what uh, both she needs and uh, what uh, Jimmy Stewart and Cary Grant represent. Jumping back to this uh, other uh, person in the film, King Baggett, which... Um, yeah, so what's up with this King Baggett guy? I was very uh, curious when I was reading through the credits list in, in, on IMDb and came across this King Baggett, who's a wedding guest, an uncredited wedding guest. Which and means looking, an I think that means an extra. Right, right. Uh, right, exactly. He was basically an extra at the wedding. And I mean, if you look at the wedding, I mean, there's so few shots of, of where you can actually see anybody in there. Yeah, but the thing about this this guy, King Baggett, William King Baggett, was an American actor, director, and writer. He was internationally famous uh, in the silent era. He was actually the first individually publicized leading man in America, referred to as king of the movies, the most photographed man in the world, and the man whose face is as familiar as the man in the moon. Wow. He, yeah, he had appeared in over 300 motion pictures from 1909 to 1947. He wrote 18 screenplays, directed 45 movies from 1912 to 1928. He ended up, uh, you know, the transition from silent to sound didn't work for him. He became an alcoholic. He had problems with some of the studio executives, and it kind of ended his career. And he turned to playing character roles and bit parts. And, and by this point in his career, he was basically just an extra, just appearing in, in bit movies through the... Uh, 30s and 40s and you know, uh, it just shows you how fleeting fame can be watch out tom cruise and everybody else i'll bet you 100 years ago or whenever you know let's say 80 years ago uh that would have been the last person you would have said would have fallen into obscurity right yeah. it's so interesting the way things like that change and i i read that uh that credit and i was just like this is an interesting character that nobody talks about now but yeah. certainly Somebody was, worth bringing yeah, up. Yeah, I was not aware of him at all until I saw him, and I I, I looked up him up a little bit too. I don't know, it's fascinating. So as far as getting this thing made, we already kind of talked about uh, the process that Hepburn went through uh, to get this thing off the ground, um, and it ended up working. I mean, it was a great film. Um, what did you think of the production? Is there anything particular that stands out for you? The cinematography, production design, anything that uh, really stands out for you, uh, Steve? Well, the, the production design particularly stands out for me. And uh, uh, Cedric Gibson, Cedric Gibson, Gibbons, Gibbons I think. Gibbons, Gibbons. Yeah. yeah. He did a ton of movies for MGM and was one of the top production uh, designers. And it just, you know, it was... Um, so uh, well done, those sets. I mean, they were all sets built on the stages at MGM, I'm sure. Probably most of the other stuff was back lot stuff at MGM. They used to have a huge back lot there. I just thought it was beautifully done. 
uh, for the production design and both the way they integrated the sets and the exterior sequences. You know, the other part is the gowns. Uh, the clothes of Catherine Hepburn are just outstanding. It just make her just pop on the screen, even in black and white. You know, just these fantastic gowns by Adrian, who was a, a great Hollywood designer. I, you know, just the, the sumptuousness of uh, the world was really clear and, and, and done in a way that you just believed you were with these very wealthy people. And uh, this is how they lived. I, th I thought it was great. I really did. The thing about Adrian's uh, costumes, particularly Tracy's dresses, that really stood out to me was, I mean, this is a, uh, the story about this society girl who everybody views as a goddess or a bronze statue or a queen. And, and I mean, they go on about, and on about that throughout the film constantly. And, you know, this is a woman who finally at the end is just like, I just want to be a human being, really. But the dresses were done to make her really kind of feel like a Greek statue. And I mean, it was amazing how how Adrian had designed these looks that just really made her look exactly like what everyone was saying she was. They played with her, like they played with her texture. The gowns really looked on that black and white film like marble. It was it was gorgeous. And I think that the patterns on them too are very, you know, they're uh, very graphic. And uh, so that would immediately, your eye will go to that first, you know, on any of those scenes. Yeah, it was a brilliantly, brilliantly conceived and executed. He has, an, uh, uh, many of his credits are just gowns only. Uh, yeah. Do we know if he did uh, the all of the the costumes for this thing? That I don't know. I doubt it. But uh, I'm sure that there was uh, MGM, you know, had a yeah. huge uh, wardrobe department. And um, I, I doubt he did anything other than uh, special gowns for uh, probably not just uh, Catherine Hepburn, but for yeah, the, the women, know, right. women or the other uh, other characters. Well, I thought, uh, you know, James Stewart, he wore great suits, right? He, you know, he's a man who wears great suits. But Cary Grant, uh, his costumes were equally fantastic. Yeah, uh, I, would, they, you know what? I, would, I would love to get those clothes. I would wear them now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I so contemporary. Oh and, yeah, fantastic collars and fabrics. They just they they draped beautifully. Like who knew I would start noticing those things? But it, it's just wonderful. His his costumes. I know it's hard not to notice them because um they are so well done and they're different. They really are. They're very very different and uh, and and like I said, they're still contemporary looking as far as I'm concerned. Going back real quick to Cedric Gibbons, who you had mentioned as the uh, the art director on this. Um, there were some, uh, I, I noticed, speaking of kind of the Greek goddess and stuff, there was a, a scene when I think it's uh, when they are first uh, talking to uh, the reporters in one of the, I think it's the, was it the South Study or whatever it was? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and um, the fireplace has some really, some of that really interesting Greek patterning going around oh. the fireplace and it's like i don't think that's the sort of thing that would have been in kind of an east coast house at the time but um maybe it was also tying into this whole look so it's it, they sure really it put it all together really smartly yeah i'm sure i'm sure it was a very uh, uh specific choice and there, yeah. speaking of uh, that whole uh, the way that house was put together and everything and i love it when liz said uh, wow do you have to be as rich as the lords to to live in a dump like this <laughs> right. It was just a great line for both, you know, it, it sort of brought the great unwashed and, you know, people who don't live like that, you know, ha ha, that's funny because, yeah, it is kind of a dump in a way. I mean, I don't know. Anyway, I thought that was a brilliant line. Last little footnote about, about Cedric Gibbons. He is credited as the designer of the Oscar statuette in 1928. Yes. That's right. Pretty wow. interesting. Pretty interesting. Everything else, I think, you know, all of the other production elements, I think they they all work really well. Franz Waxman's music is great. The editing, I think, works really nicely. It comes together really nicely. In the end, it just makes a, a really beautiful film. Um, and, you know, it's a movie that did well. Yeah, it did. It was a it was a hit movie. Um, I'm not sure exactly what where it stood in the uh, in the for that year, but I know it was a hit movie. And you know, it's one of those things that um, everything contributed towards its success, whether it's a, a production design or the camera or uh, the photography, I mean, and um, and all the supporting characters. And speaking of uh, how well it did as far as the Oscars go, it did get nominated for, it looks like, uh, six Oscars. Best uh, lead actor, James Stewart, who won. He said uh, that the only reason he got it was it was a consolation for losing the previous year for Mr. Smith right. Goes to Washington. And he said Henry Fonda. 
in the Grapes of Wrath should have won. And, you know, Grapes of Wrath, Henry Fonda, awfully good. I, I kind of agree. And I kind of also agree that he should have won for Mr. Smith the previous yeah, year. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I know. Well, you know, the thing about the Oscars that most people don't realize is it's not really there to reward excellence. It's the most brilliant marketing scheme ever cooked up by any industry is what it is. And it's uh, they the, the Academy makes money on the Oscars and promotes its movies with the Oscars. And uh, it's the greatest free publicity any any uh, industry has ever come up with. It, it just really does not exist as a purpose to uh, really reward the best films of the time. Again, yeah, time and time again, we see that. Like, uh, how many times do you look back? on on films that have won best picture and go ah the greatest show on earth boy that was the best <laughs> film that year <laughs> exactly. exactly right that does promote the industry beautifully it makes people talk about movies makes people go and see movies uh it it, it keeps movies in our consciousness um and uh it's a great great uh great thing yeah oh absolutely and you know i mean the people who win obviously they they feel great i mean it's it is a nice little pat on the back regardless of whether they feel that uh, it was something that they definitely deserved or or what i mean it still is going to be something that makes you feel good to get right yeah and george cooker was nominated as well yep george cooker was nominated he lost to john ford for the grapes of wrath uh ruth hussey was nominated like you said for best supporting actress she lost to jane darwell in the grapes of wrath uh, Catherine Hepburn was nominated for Best Lead Actress, but she lost to Ginger Rogers in Kitty Foyle. Um, oh. The Best Picture lost to Rebecca, um, Hitchcock's uh, film. Um, and uh, Donald Ogden Stewart ended up winning the only other Oscar for this film for oh. Best uh, Writing Screenplay. And, of course, when he won, he said, I have no one to thank but myself. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Good Not to him. put too fine a point on <laughs> it. Clearly forgetting it was based on a play. <laughs> exactly. And also, I think he must have said that partly tongue-in-cheek, but maybe not. But also, I, they say that Waldo uh, Salt uh, was uncredited, right. did some yeah. work on the screenplay as well. That's right, funny. right. There are two, uh, two um, blackballed uh, writers. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's something that I, I find so interesting, just the way that the whole uh, blacklist ended up working and shaping the careers of so many people or, or destroying them. I mean, it's a pretty... Uh, Terrible. Crazy, crazy yeah. time. Uh, this film did get remade a few times uh, in various uh, capacities. Obviously, there were a few radio versions. That was kind of a big thing at the time, plus the various stage shows. Uh, with and without these stars, there were some versions uh, with all three of them uh, reprising their roles in the radio mm -hmm. shows. Um, not to mention the film remake in 1956, the MGM musical High Society with Bing Crosby, yeah. Grace Kelly in her last film, Frank Sinatra, Celeste Holm, and, of course, Louis Armstrong. Yeah, you know, and a fun movie. I haven't seen it. I, I've never seen that one. It's one of those that I, I keep meaning to see, but for some reason it's kept slipping through the cracks. But uh, you like it, though, huh? Well, I haven't seen it in a long time. I remember seeing it uh, when I, uh, quite a while ago. And uh, I don't know at the time where I, that I realized it was a remake of uh, Philadelphia Story. So I'm going to have to watch it again just to see it. And then they made an Italian version. Oh, did they really? I didn't hear about that one. Yeah, there's some in the, in the in the seventies, I think. Uh, there was an Italian production of with uh, none of the ra actors I recognize. Interesting, interesting. Well, uh, how did it do in the box office, Andy? Well, you know me. Um, I am a big fan of good old Eddie Mannix. We've talked about him and his MGM ledgers a number of times, and how well he tracked the money. I think he's one of the only people that actually uh, really helped help me at least when I'm doing this part of the show. Uh, he's always there. Um, the Philadelphia Story opened December 27th, 1940. It was a very limited release. It did expand later in January. They uh, opted to do that so as not to compete with the play, which was touring the country at the time. Um, the movie cost right. nine, $914,000 to make. And they spent, it sound, looks like, about an additional $1,073,000 on prints and advertising, making a total budget of just under $2 million, adjusted to just over $33 million in, in today's dollars. Upon its release, it did break the previous box office record held at Radio City Music Hall, where it broke $600,000 in six weeks, which is pretty amazing. I went at 35 cents a ticket or something like that. Ah, something Jeez. crazy cheap like that, yeah. Uh, the movie did go on to make $2.4 million domestically and 885000 elsewhere, giving it a total gross of about $3.3 million, or an adjusted gross of just over $54 million. Uh, it makes for an adjusted profit per finished minute of about $189,000 in adjusted dollars. Who who owns a, owns it today? Did MGM did that go with uh, MGM selling a lot of its uh, 
titles? Do you know? Gosh, I should have looked at the uh, DVD case to see who uh, who put that out. I'm not quite sure. That's yeah, a because question. a lot of those uh, studios, before they realized how much uh, their long term, you know, before they knew all the outlets we were going to have today, um, <clears throat> sold off chunks of their library, which is their crazy if you, from today's perspective. But uh, they did. Yeah, I, I know we talked about that on a show a long time ago, Pete. I can't remember yeah. which movie it was, but yeah, it's it's nuts how. It really, it was kind of the TV market when that kicked off, where people all of a sudden started uh, grabbing all these things up, realizing that there was kind of a, an opportunity there, right? Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah they, I think a lot of these different con- uh, yeah. companies ended up uh, losing out. Quite this a bit. is one of them. Studio release for at least the, the latest release is Warner Home Video. Right. Um, Jim, I think they sold off a, a bunch to, uh, to Warner Brothers. And I know Universal one time sold almost, or rather Paramount sold almost everything to Universal. And, uh, but uh, I know it's interesting to see that um, that it still has a life today, though. Well, it sure does, and it was a it was a delight to watch. I gotta say, in terms of of you know how well the show or the film has has lasted over the years, I watched it with my wife last night, and uh, she actually said about halfway through, she said to me, "Ugh, I can't watch it anymore," and walked out. <laughs> and I I was left thinking, "What? What? Who are you, woman? Who are you?" Uh, but, uh, yeah, apparently, uh, apparently didn't hold up well to her as much as I, I quite enjoyed it. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, I think it's probably to the point where we should rank it. Don't you think? Let's sure. do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel, and you will see the list of all of our films that we've talked about on this show. Usual drill applies. Pretend you're on a des- desert island and all you've got is a TV and one of, and, and the Philadelphia story and one other movie. That's how we're going to do it. We're going to rank it starting with Andy. All right, first up, we have The Philadelphia Story or The Road Warrior. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. Mad Max action here. This is, this is a little bit of what we call a flick chart hate crime. <laughs> How do you even uh, begin? Wait, which one was Road Warrior again? That is the second one. The second one, yeah. Mad Max is first, and then Mad Max 2 was The Road Warrior. Yeah. Um, well, I, for me, i, I got to go with Philadelphia Story. Mm. This is tough. Yeah. I mean, I love Mad Max. I'm glad that one wasn't the one. <laughs> <laughs> They're hard. They're hard. You know, I'm, I, these are these are really both high up there on my chart. I'm a little struggling right now. I know. Now the problem is, it, yeah, we're going to decide where it goes on this first vote, I know. Andy. This is, you got Lord Humongous. I know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, watching Jimmy Stewart uh, drunk for uh, an hour, I'm going to say Philadelphia Story, though. All right, there we go. Philadelphia Story it is. Next up, we have Philadelphia Story or The Hurt Locker. Boy, I, I, Philadelphia Story in a heartbeat, even though I like The Hurt Locker. Yeah, I, I'm going to say the same thing. Pete. Really? I yeah, mean, it's, I, a, it's a principled loss, but I'm leaning pretty heavily toward The Hurt Locker. I really enjoyed that movie. But I, I've already lost, so as, as the, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll take it. Are you going to be watching The Hurt Locker 40 years after it's made? Oh, see now I don't. Who knows? In <laughs> forty years, I'm gonna. That's a tough question. That's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the Philadelphia story definitely holds up. Yeah. All right. Well, next one we have the Philadelphia story. This is this is where it gets tough, Pete. Or aliens. Oh. oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, alien. Not alien. You're talking aliens. This is aliens. aliens. Yeah, oh. James Cameron and Game the Queen. Over, man. Philadelphia story. I'm saying aliens. Uh, you guys, you're coming up with these second movies rather than the first one. You would have forced me to say alien if it was the first one. I wish we it's, had a choice. This is the per- the perils of flick chart. Oh, I uh, see. I it's see. just yeah. completely, it's a robot. This is our robot overlord. See, oh. I won't even be watching movies in 40 years. I'll be working in a salt mine or something. <laughs> Slave to the robots. Uh, I will, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to say, and this is, this is just, it, it's my era. Uh, I am also going to be with Andy on Aliens. Yeah. But, uh, all right. Next one, we have The Philadelphia Story or The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Oh, man. That's mm. a tough one. That is a tough one. I, You know, I have to go with The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly because it, it created its own genre. Yeah. I, I'm going to go with that one, too. It's uh, That's, uh, oh, man, but these are both such great films. But uh, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly... 
for me is just uh, you know such a pinnacle of uh, westerns, in particular the uh, spaghetti westerns. So definitely, and and, and it, it it created some genres, spaghetti westerns, and it you know it just was something different. We'd never seen anything like that before. Where Philadelphia Story, we've seen clever comedies and great acting in comedies, but boy, I'd never seen anything like that. No, oh, I'm with you guys. Good, the bad, the ugly, and Morricone's score. I mean, come on. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. The Philadelphia Story or Zero Dark Thirty, more Catherine Bigelow. Uh, I am Philadelphia Story on this one. Yeah, me too. I will be Philadelphia Story on this one. But you struggled on Hurt Locker. I, I know, and I felt like I was already going to lose, so I decided to go in with a commitment. <laughs> there you go. Uh, the Philadelphia Story or The Descent. You haven't seen that pop up in a while. <laughs> Wait, I don't think I'm qualified. What's The Descent? The Descent from 2005 about a group of women who go spelunking. And uh, they end up in count. They get stuck in the cave uh, because of a cave in through a tunnel and they have to find another way out. And they end up coming across some really creepy uh, humanoid, uh, blind humanoid creatures under there that are bent on uh, eating them. By the description alone, I have to go with Phil- Philadelphia story. <laughs> what? What? I never saw the descent. <laughs> oh, well, OK. <laughs> oh. It's actually a really good movie. It was a terrific movie. And that was a movie that I, I I mean, I feel like in terms of, of, uh, and I don't see a a lot of horror. I'm one of those with a soft stomach for the stuff, but, but that I do that, that movie was thrilling just for the, the way they shot caves. It is inspirational camera work. I mean, it was just beautiful. I'm going to have to watch it because uh, I've shot caves they are very difficult to shoot. Uh, it sounds good. It sounds like my kind of movie, but so I'll have to remove myself from this voting because I haven't seen that one. Fair no enough. worries. No worries. But I, I'm still going to say Philadelphia Story as much as I love The Descent. Really? Andy? Yeah. It's so Philadelphia Story is way up on my list, buddy. I know. I totally get it. I just it surprises <laughs> me knowing you as long as I have. I, too, am Philadelphia Story, which should surprise no one as much as I love The Descent. Uh, I, I'm not going to watch it all that often because of how I, I fare with that kind of stuff. But. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, it's good stuff. Uh, the Philadelphia Story, or uh, little uh, this is a good one. No Country for Old Men. Wow, that was a really good movie. You know, it's like apples and oranges. A little difficult to compare, yeah. but uh, that's that's what makes flick charts so uh, frustratingly enjoyable. <laughs> you know what? I, I I'm gonna have to say Philadelphia Story uh, only because I think that the nihilism of the other movie, uh, Good Country for Old Men. Uh, just I, I don't know. I'm maybe a little bit Pollyannish at heart. I like the uh, the uh, affirmation of humanity in the Philadelphia story. Oh, that's such a good case for it. I was going to be all high and mighty about Javier Bardem and his performance in that film. I thought was so moving. It was, uh, yeah. In terms, it's just so like diabolically crazy, um, but understated at the same time. I thought it was just terrific. And of course, the Coens. It was uh, great. Yeah. Terrific. Oh, but now you've now you've made me feel like I'm such a downer. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, where are you? I was waiting for you. <laughs> ah, well, I'm going to be no country on this one. Yeah, uh, boy, these are really tough. I'm going to say no country also, um, but now I feel like a nihilist. For That's right. Now we're nihilists. <laughs> Great. You're a nihilist. That's okay. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Uh, the Philadelphia story or Moneyball, a little baseball. You know, uh, Moneyball is my favorite, well, close to my favorite uh, sports movie. I thought that Brad Pitt should have won the Oscar for his performance in that movie. And I tell young actors who ask me advice about acting to go get that movie and watch Bill, watch, um, watch uh, Pitt in that movie, Brad Pitt, because he walks into every single scene uh, with a pass. He's either eating something or he's got something on his mind or he's, He's just he, he comes into every moment of that movie uh, with with just so much going on. And it all adds up to that character and that character driving that story. Um, I just love that movie. And I like baseball and I like sports. Uh, boy, that's a toss up for me. I don't know. I well, I, I have a, a similar I mean, it's a it's a ridiculously unnatural connection to that movie. I love it. I, I love it so much. It wins any pretty much any time it goes up against us. Uh, it, it wins for me. So it it, it it Philadelphia story doesn't chan- stand a chance on this one. I, I, I kind of have to go with uh, Moneyball, too, also because it was um, again, it's a it's something that was unique, I think, uh, in uh, for a movie the way they handled it. 
I'm really uh, split between these two. I kind of am leaning toward Philadelphia story, but I could go either way. So uh, I, I guess I'll say Moneyball since uh, yeah. that's the way it's going. Yeah. And that leaves it at 55 on our flick chart, which is a very good place for this on our flick chart. Yeah. Out of? It's about 270 of... movies that we've talked about oh, so far. Right. So oh. it's, uh, it's up there. Oh, good. People like it. Yes, that's a nice pick. Uh, that's a great pick, Steve. What is it on a star rating out of five for our partners over at letterbox.com? Where do you put this? Uh, one? Philadelphia story? Yes. Yeah. Four and three quarters. Ooh, no, getting... I got to say five. I got to give it five stars. All right, Pete. Andy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I uh, boy, I really enjoyed it. I had a, a, a great time with it, especially now that I've, I've sort of sat on it over the last sort of 24 hours since we watched it. I watched it yesterday evening. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to give it a good four and a half stars for me. Uh, this is a, a total five star film for me. It's, uh, you know, I, I, we, I had this in a film class back in college and really just kind of um, fell in love with it. And I've seen it just off and on uh, throughout my life. And it's just been something that every time I watch it, it's just so easy to get into these characters that I, I really enjoy. And I find the story of, of Tracy's journey so touching and uh, heartwarming that uh, it's an absolute five star for me. Nice pick. So, yeah, that's fantastic. great choice there, Steve. Yeah. Great, great okay. choice. Well, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for coming. We uh, we definitely appreciate uh, you being here. Um, you know, we we talked a little bit about kind of what you've done and stuff, but is there anything that you're working on right now that you want to tell people about? Well, uh, no, I'm working on a couple things that are not uh, getting ready. That aren't. I don't know when I'm going to be able to shoot them, if ever. You know, that's how the business is. But uh, one thing I did was um, just a couple of days ago, I filmed some commentary for a new release in a box set of House and its sequel. Oh, yeah, baby. So um, there would be a bunch of commentary on there by myself and Bill Cat and, um, uh, you know, I, I, most of the actors and the writer, uh, Ethan Wiley and Sean Cunningham produced it with me. So, and that'll be, uh, and I think there were, you know, House, the second story was the first sequel. And I think there are a couple more after that. So that box set is coming out at some point. Uh, I don't know. I just did the interview. So I guess it'd probably be a good stocking stuffer. All right. So what is that? How does that feel? I mean, this is one, this one's what, this is 30 years this year, right? I guess so. You know, I've uh, been very lucky to have been involved in a number of movies that have, uh, have a life of their own and, and many, many sequels. And that's uh, kind of gratifying that, uh, you know, People still see my movies and still want to buy them. It's kind of shocking to me. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's funny that, I mean, you know, I love House. I, when I was a kid, uh, it, it was the perfect age. I was at the perfect age for that film uh -huh. to just, it was totally my sensibilities. I can't tell you how many times I ended up watching that when it came out on video. It was just ridiculous. But so this film, uh, you obviously love enough. You're doing commentary and everything. But then I was reading something and I was looking at um, some of the stuff that you have done uh, or like I think it was the Friday the 13th box set that came out recently. And I noticed that there's no like commentary from you on those films. Is there uh, something with those films that's keeping you from uh, doing commentary on those ones? No, um, <clears throat> not really. Other than um, I've, I've sort of declined to be uh, interviewed or even though I'm in all the books about them and everything um, about those Friday the 13th, only because it just seems that there's so much chatter about them. Uh, I just, you know, I don't, I don't know if I have anything new to add and not really that interested in self-promotion and uh, everything else. So, you know, Friday I felt was uh, very well covered by, by everybody else, you know, and all the stories about it are pretty well known and get retold by, by various participants. So, uh, it just wasn't something that it's just something that I've never really uh, I don't know, just never really done much for. But House, uh, you know, it was uh, interesting because that movie, um, when I made it, you know, I made it because I found the script or the script was uh, Fred Decker had uh, told me about the script and I read the script and I, I knew I could make it and make it funny. And um, the fact is that while I got it made and would made it without anybody realizing it was actually a comedy. <laughs> They had no idea. They thought I was making a horror movie. That's uh, awesome. <laughs> and in fact, the guy who did the, uh, the sound, all the sound effects for us, all the sound work, we hired a company that would do all the, you know, breaking down the sound and doing the, the foley and doing the, the, the tracks and getting it ready for mix and mixing it. He had been working on it for like three months, he and his crew. 
And at the first screening audience, recruited our audience screening, it was a great screen. It went well. Everybody was laughing at the right spots and do everything was playing great. And there this guy is uh, pacing the back of the movie theater, clearly upset. He said, uh, what's what's wrong, Jim? What's what's wrong? He said, can you believe it? People are laughing at this. What's the matter with these people? <laughs> that is so funny. And that's exactly like why I loved it so much. It was like the perfect like horror comedy. Yeah. And he, they, 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 anyway, so uh, and I did it because I, I just wanted to not just do horror. So and that led to me doing actually uh, Soul Man. So it helped me uh, get to do some comedies. And really kind of led you down a path where you've been doing all this TV and stuff that is really much more dramatic and uh, character based and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, my TV work is uh, like the Wonder Years pilot is. And uh, Dawson's Creek is more uh, very character based. We Great just uh, just I just introduced my kids. Uh, I've got a 10 and a 14 year old and just I, I mean, week two weeks ago, introduced them to Dawson's Creek with the pilot uh, and uh, uh, just uh, really uh, gratifying how well that holds up. Uh, although the line that sticks with my family is Dawson has a penis. <laughs> <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, really great, really great, and and just fantastic to have you on board uh, for this episode. Thank you so much again, uh, Steve Miner. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. If you like what you heard, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Instagram, Pinterest, Letterboxd, Flickchart, and, of course, YouTube. And don't forget to head on over to iTunes, leave us a rating and comment. It really does help more people find us. Thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. Until next time, another place, Edward. I'm going to use you to be my friend. It's hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. All that said, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. Becoming a Next Real member gives you access to all sorts of additional and exclusive content. Plus, you're helping us keep the lights on. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership, where you can learn more about becoming a member, which costs a measly $5 a month, practically the same as one fancy coffee drink. And you get so much more. Every month, we record a bonus episode exclusively for members. Those episodes cover movies from whatever series we're covering at the moment, or add to previous series. Some movies we've covered that only members get to hear us discuss include The Blues Brothers, The Russia House, Naked Lunch, Independence Day, the Hot Rock. And Relic, the better one. Plus, members get to vote on what we're going to discuss for those episodes. We also record additional pre- and post-show content in regular episodes that only members get to hear. Like conversations about similarly themed movies. And answering listener questions from our live member chat. Speaking of our live member chat, we record almost all of our episodes in Discord, where members can chat right along with us live. Members get access to other members-only channels in our Discord community as well. On top of all that, members get all episodes a full week earlier than everyone else in a private Next Reel feed just for them that includes all the shows in the Next Reel family. The Next Reel, the film board, movies we like, sitting in the dark, and more new projects on the way. To top it all off, members don't have to listen to ads. We've already eliminated those annoying, dynamically inserted ads that, let's face it, we all hate it. We are listening to you. We love podcasting for a living, and those ads help to pay the bills. Now, we're counting on you, dear listener. We promise we aren't going back to those terrible, dynamically inserted ads that don't relate to us at all. All we ask is that you consider supporting the Next Real family of podcasts with a membership. Again, it's $5 per month or $55 per year. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership. Thenextreel.com slash membership. Get your access to early ad-free episodes with bonus content, member bonus episodes, and access to member channels and live streams in Discord by signing up today.